You are listening to the Adult Sabbath School Lessons for the third quarter of 2022. This is lesson number seven of the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide in the Crucible with Christ. The lesson is titled Indestructible Hope and is ready for teaching on August 13. The author is Pastor Gavin Anthony, who was conference president in Iceland when he wrote this series of lessons. Today, your lesson is read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, August 6. Before we start, let's pray. Now, Heavenly Father, once again we open your word and we're studying about what it's like to be in the crucible this quarter. And that crucible can be very difficult at times, but we know that you have thought about it, that Jesus has been there, and that there is hope for each of us. And as we study this lesson about the indestructible hope, We pray that our hearts may be gladdened, that our hope may be strengthened, and that we may be looking forward to that day when Jesus will come again. Because as it says in our memory text, new hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we open your word this week, we pray for your blessing. And today I'd like to pray for those who are listening in Kaitaia in New Zealand or Dili in Indonesia or Dar es Salaam in Tanzania or Guam in the Mariana Islands in the Pacific or Doha in Qatar or Vienna in Austria or Newcastle in the UK and also Newcastle in Australia and Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia and Montevideo in Uruguay. Lord, each of us needs to get to know you as not only our Saviour, but the one we can trust and take us through all of the problems that occur in our lives each day. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. And our memory text this week is Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Let's read that again, Romans 5 and verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. When in church, surrounded by smiling people, how easy it is to talk and sing about hope. But, When we find ourselves within the crucible, hope does not always seem so easy. As circumstances press in around us, we begin to question everything, particularly the wisdom of God. In one of his books, C.S. Lewis writes about a make-believe lion. Wanting to meet this lion, someone asks if the lion is safe. The person is told that he's not safe, but he's good. Even though we don't always understand God and he seems to do unpredictable things, that doesn't mean that God is against us. It simply means that we don't have the full picture yet. But we struggle with the idea that for us to have peace, confidence and hope, God must be understandable and predictable. He needs to be, in our thinking, safe. As such, we set ourselves up for disappointment. And now for the week at a glance, just this one question this week. How does our understanding of the character of God help us maintain hope in the crucible? Sunday, August 7, The Big Picture When we are hurting, it is very easy to presume that what happens to us is the only thing that matters. But there is a slightly larger picture than just me. As we read in Revelation 12, verse 7, And war broke out in heaven, Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. And Romans 8, verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groans and labours with birth pangs together until now. Read Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. What did Habakkuk face? 
Habakkuk chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear. Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore perverse judgment proceeds. You might expect that God would say something like, That's really terrible, Habakkuk. Let me come and help you immediately. But God's answer is the opposite. He tells Habakkuk that it is going to get worse. Read this in verses 5 to 11. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days, which you will not believe, though it were told you. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth, to possess dwelling places that are not theirs, they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their charges charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings, and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold, for they heap up earthen mounds and seize it. Then his mind changes, and he transgresses. He commits its offence, ascribing this power to his God. Israel had been taken into captivity by the Assyrians, but God promises that worse is coming. The Babylonians will now carry away the people of Judah. Habakkuk cries out again in verses 12 to 17, and then waits to see what God is going to say. Let's begin at verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? You shall not die, O Lord. You have appointed them for judgment. O Rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously, and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with a hook, they catch them in their net, and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore they rejoice and are glad, therefore they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet, because by them their share is sumptuous, and their food plentiful. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? How does God's introduction to the promised destruction of Babylon in Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, bring hope? Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Habakkuk chapter 2 is God's promise of the destruction of the Babylonians. Hebrews 10.37 quotes Habakkuk 2 verse 3, hinting of a messianic application to this promise in the future, as you read in Hebrews 10.37, And yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and will not tarry. With the same certainty that the destruction of Babylon was promised, so we also have the certainty of the destruction of Babylon the Great, as it says in Revelation 18, verse 2. Habakkuk was trapped between the great evil surrounding him and God's promise of worse to come. Yet this is precisely where we find ourselves in salvation history. Great evil is around us, but the Bible predicts that much worse is to come. The key to Habakkuk's survival is that he is brought to see the whole picture. Therefore, in chapter 3, he is able to pray an incredible prayer of praise because of what God will do in the future. 
And so to finish the day, read Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. What does Habakkuk identify as his reasons for hope? What is the hope of God's people as we wait for the last prophetic scenes to unfold? And how can you make this hope your own? Habakkuk chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. When I heard, my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes to the people, he will invade them with his troops. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labour of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, he will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills." to the chief musician with my stringed instruments. Monday, August 8. Who Our Father Is Oswald Chambers writes, Have you ever been asking God what he is going to do? He will never tell you. God does not tell you what he is going to do. He reveals to you who he is. And that's from my utmost for his highest. What do you think Chambers means by this idea? As we know, the book of Job begins with great personal tragedy for Job. He loses everything except his life and his wife, and she suggests that he curse God and die in chapter 2, verse 9. What follows is a discussion in which his friends try to work out why it has all happened. Throughout all of these discussions, God remains silent. Then suddenly, in Job chapter 38, God appears and speaks. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? He says in chapter 38 verse 2. Without pausing, God asked Job some 60 jaw-dropping questions. Open your Bible and scan through these in Job chapter 38 and 39. After the last question, Job replies, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. In Job 40 verses 4 and 5. But God is not finished. He then begins again and asks another set of big questions in succession. Let's look at chapter 38 and 39 and see if we can find some of these 60 jaw-dropping questions questions. Verse 1, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, when I fixed my limit for it, and set bars and doors, when I said, This far you may come, but no farther, and here your proud waves must stop. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, and the wicked be shaken out of it? It takes on form like clay under a seal, and stands out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and the upraised arm is broken. Have you entered the springs of the sea, or have you walked in search of the depths? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. 
Where is the way to the dwelling of light and darkness? Where is its place? That you may take it to its territory, that you may know the paths to its home. Do you know it because you were born then? Or because the number of your days is great? Have you entered the treasury of snow, or have you seen the treasury of hail, which I have reserved for the day of trouble, for the day of battle and war? By what way is light diffused, or the east wind scattered over the earth? Who has divided a channel for the overflowing water, or a path for the thunderbolt? To cause it to rain on a land where there is no one, a wilderness in which there is no man, to satisfy the desolate waste, and cause to spring forth the growth of tender grass? Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the jops of dew, from whose womb comes the ice, and the frost of heaven, who gives it birth? The waters harden like stone, and the surface of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades, or loose the belt of Orion? Can you bring out Maseroth in its season, or can you guide the great bear with its cubs? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you set your dominion over the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds, that an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send out lightnings, that they may go and say to you, Here we are? Or... Who has put wisdom in the mind, or who has given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds by wisdom, or who can pour out the bottles of the heaven when the dust hardens in the clumps, and the clods cling together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion, or satisfy the appetite of young lions when they crouch in their dens, or lurk in their lairs to lie in wait? Who provides food for the raven? when its young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food. And then chapter 39. Do you know the time when the wild mountain goats bear young? Or can you mark where the deer gives birth? Can you number the months that they fulfil? Or do you know the time when the bear young? They bow down, they bring forth their young, they deliver their offspring, their young ones are healthy, they grow strong with grain, they depart and do not return to them. Who set the wild donkey free? Who loosed the bonds of the onager? Whose home I have made the wilderness, and the barren land his dwelling? He scorns the tumult of the city. He does not heed the shouts of the driver. The range of the mountains is his pasture, and he searches after every green thing. Will the wild ox be willing to serve you? Will he bed by your manger? Can you bind the wild ox in the farrow with rope? Or will he plough the valleys behind you? Will you trust him because his strength is great? Or will you leave your labour to him? Will you trust him to bring home your grain and gather it to your threshing floor? The wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are her wings and pinions like the kindly stalks? For she leaves her eggs on the ground and warms them in the dust. She forgets that a foot may crush them, or that a wild beast may break them. She treats her young harshly as though they were not hers. Her labour is in vain without concern, because God deprived her of wisdom, and did not endow her with understanding. When she lifts herself on high, she scorns the horse and its rider. Have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Can you frighten him like a locust? His majestic snorting strikes terror. He pours in the valley and rejoices in his strength. He gallops into the clash of arms and he mocks at fear and is not frightened. Nor does he turn back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him, the glittering spear and javelin. He devours the distance with fierceness and rage. Nor does he come to halt because the trumpet has sounded. At the blast of the trumpet he says, Aha! He smells the battle from afar, the thunder of captains and shoutings. Does the hawk fly by your wisdom and spread its wings toward the south? Does the eagle mount up at your command and make it nest on high? On the rock it dwells and resides, on the crag of the rock and the stronghold. From there it spies out the prey, its eyes observe from afar, its young ones suck up blood, and where the slain are, there it is. 
Read Job's final response in Job 42, verses 1 to 6. What was God trying to tell Job, and what was the effect on him? Job 42, beginning at verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, Who is this? who hides counsel without knowledge. Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I abhor myself, and repent in dust and ashes." God never answers any of the why questions of Job's friends. But God does paint a picture of his unparalleled greatness as revealed through the astonishing works of creation. After this, Job certainly does not need any answers. The need for explanations has been eclipsed by the overwhelming picture of the magnificence of God. This story reveals a fascinating paradox. Hope and encouragement can spring from the realisation that we know so little. Instinctively, we try to find comfort by knowing everything, and so we become discouraged when we cannot know. But sometimes God highlights our ignorance so that we may realise that human hope can find security only in a being much greater than ourselves. And so to finish the day... Are things that you just can't understand happening now? If so, focus on the character of God. How can doing that give you the hope that you need to persevere through what's for now incomprehensible? Tuesday, August 9, Our Father's Presence Isaiah 41 verse 13 reads, For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Someone once said, When God seems far away, who is the one who is moved? When problems strike, we presume that God has deserted us. The truth is that He hasn't gone anywhere. God's presence seems very far away to the Jews in exile. Yet, through Isaiah, God assures them of future deliverance. However, while the actual return to Jerusalem was still many years in the future, God wanted his people to know that he had not moved away from them and that there was every reason for hope. Read Isaiah 41 verses 8 to 14. What reasons for hope can you identify for people waiting eagerly for future deliverance? How does this promise help us as we wait for our exile on earth to end? Isaiah 41, beginning at verse 8. But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. You, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest regions and said to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all those who were incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing. And those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contended with you, those who war against you, shall be as nothing, as a non-existent thing. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. Fear not. You worm, Jacob, you men of Israel, I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. 
One of the most powerful images in these verses is found in verse 13. The sovereign God of the universe says that his people do not need to fear because he is the one who takes hold of your right hand. It is one thing to imagine God guiding events on earth from a big throne light years away from our earth, but it is an altogether different picture to realise that he is close enough to hold the hands of his dearly beloved people. When we are busy, it can be hard to remember that God is so close to us. But when we do remember that he is Emmanuel, God with us, it makes a difference, such a difference. When God's presence is with us, so are his purposes, his promises, and his transforming power. And so to finish the day, over the next few days, try an experiment. At every moment possible, try to remind yourself that the God of the universe is close enough to you to hold your hand and is personally promising you help. Keep a record of how this changes the way you live. Be prepared to discuss your experience in class on Sabbath. Wednesday, August 10, Our Father's Plans for Us Everyone is looking for hope, but where is it found? For some people, hope is found in the smile of a friend. For others, hope grows out of financial security or a stable marriage. Where do you normally look for hope and courage? In the book of Jeremiah, the prophet is writing to people who had lost hope in their exile. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion, we read in Psalm 137 verse 1. But even though they are heartbroken, Jeremiah lays out reasons they should not give up hope. What reasons for hope are given in Jeremiah 29 verses 1 to 10? Now, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. This happened after Jeconiah the king, the queen mother, the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit, Take wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, after seventy years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my word, my good word toward you, and cause you to return to this place. In this passage, there are three important sources of hope worth highlighting. First, God tells his people that they should not give up hope because their situation is not the result of chance or unpredictable evil. For God himself says, I carried Judah into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon in Jeremiah 24 verse 9. Though evil seems to surround them, Judah has never left the centre of God's hands. Second, 
God tells his people that they should not give up hope because he can work even within their present difficulties. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And that's verse 7. Third, God tells his people that they should not give up hope because he is going to bring an end to their exile at a specific time. This is what the Lord says when 70 years are completed for Babylon. I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. In verse 10. After God explains how he was in charge of their past, is in charge of their presence, and will be in charge of their future, he then beautifully conveys his tender care for his people in the next five verses, in Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 14. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away, captive. And so to finish the day, Reread Jeremiah twenty nine eleven to fourteen, saying your name after the word you, as if God is making these promises to you personally. Apply these promises for yourself in whatever your present struggles might be. Now I'm going to do it with my name, but I invite you to do it with yours. Jeremiah 29, beginning at verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, Percy, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, Percy. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, Percy, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you, Percy, from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, Percy, says the Lord, and I will bring you, Percy, to the place from which I cause you, Percy, to be carried away captive. Thursday, August 11, Our Father's Discipline Read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 to 13. What's the message to us here, and how does it fit in with what we have been studying this quarter? Hebrews 12, beginning at verse 5, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to us, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness." Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed." In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 to 13, Paul describes trials in the context of discipline. 
In the New International Version Bible translation of this passage, various forms of the word discipline appear ten times. In the Greek world, this word was the most basic word for education. So, to understand discipline is to understand how God educates us in the school of faith that Paul has been describing before in Hebrews 11. Throughout Hebrews 11, Paul has been painting pictures of men and women of faith. Their faith was what kept them going when they were faced with all sorts of trying situations. As we enter chapter 12, Paul turns to us, the readers, and says that since so many people before us have persevered against incredible odds, we also can run and finish the life of faith. The key is to fix our eyes upon Jesus, as you read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, that he may be an example when times are difficult, as you read in verse 3. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Reading chapter 12 is like being given a set of reading glasses. Without these glasses, our vision or understanding of hardship will always be fuzzy. But looking through these glasses will correct the blurred explanation of suffering that our culture presses upon us. Then we will be able to understand clearly and be able to respond to trials intelligently. Read through the glasses of Hebrews 12 verses 1 to 13. Now, concentrate on verses 5 to 13 and answer these questions. What is the source of discipline? What is our response to discipline? What is the goal of discipline? Let's begin chapter 12 of Hebrews at verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls." You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to us. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Having read through Hebrews 12, 1 to 3 again, make a list of all the reasons you can identify with as grounds for hope. How have you experienced this hope in your own time of spiritual education?
Friday, August 12. From the book Prophets and Kings, page 162, written by Ellen White, we read, Into the experience of all there come times of keen disappointment and utter discouragement, days when sorrow is the portion, and it is hard to believe that God is still the kind benefactor of his earthborn children. Days when troubles harass the soul till death seems preferable to life. It is then that many lose their hold on God and are brought into the slavery of doubt, the bondage of unbelief. Could we at such times discern with spiritual insight the meaning of God's providences, we should see angels seeking to save us from ourselves, striving to plant our feet upon a foundation more firm than the everlasting hills, and new faith, new life would spring into being. End of quote. And that brings us to our five discussion questions for this week. One, Ellen G. White says that all of us experience times of keen disappointment and utter discouragement. How well do we notice each other as we go through such times? How can we better learn to be agents of hope for each other when we experience such bitter disappointments? Two, as a class, go over your answers to Tuesday's final question. What difference did it make in your life as you kept the reality of God's nearness ever before you? Three, in class, read aloud sections in Job chapter 38, 39, 40 and 41. What kind of picture of God does it present? What do you learn that gives you hope and encouragement? How does the Sabbath fit into this picture? How does it help keep before us the nature and character of God? 4. Hope that transforms comes from heaven. This means that we can pray for hope to be brought into each other's lives. Spend some time praying for those whose hope has been faltering recently, that their hope may be renewed. More than that, what can you do for others who are in a losing struggle to find hope? And five, if someone is willing, ask that person to recount a time that despair and trials caused him or her to lose hope and faith. What turned that person around? What can we share with one another that can help when we are in times of doubt and despair? Inside Story And here's Sibylla reading the seventh part of our continuing mission story for this quarter. Thank you, Sibylla. Father Surrenders, Part 7 by Andrew McChesney Four days after Junior's baptism, evil spirits ordered Father to kill his family. Otherwise, they warned Junior and Mother would destroy him because they were praying for him. For the first time, Father mustered up the courage to talk back. How, he asked, aren't our prayers more powerful? The spirits backed down and told Father to leave his home in Manaus, Brazil. They told him to take a boat to one of the five cities where Candoble priests were waiting for him. But when Father sought to buy a boat ticket, none were available to those cities. The only tickets were to Kawari. Remembering an uncle in Kawari, Father decided to sail there. Uncle Cesario Ferreira was thrilled to see Father and he organised a family reunion. Father didn't know the relatives well, but he confided that a spiritual conflict had erupted at home. 92-year-old Aunt Teresa patted him on the shoulder. Son, it's time for you to give up, she said. You have been serving evil spirits your whole life. Now it's time to serve God. Father looked shocked. Are you a Protestant Christian, he asked, remembering that the evil spirits had told him to stay away from them. Aunt Teresa smiled and motioned toward the other relatives, who also were smiling. Son, we're all Protestant Christians, she said. The next day, Father worriedly called a temple priest for advice. Uncle Cesario, who was preparing breakfast, overheard the conversation. After Father hung up, he said, 
Son, did you know that Jesus cast out evil spirits? How did he do that? Father asked. For the next three days, Uncle Cesario read Bible stories about how Jesus cast out evil spirits. On the fourth day, he told about the man possessed by a legion of evil spirits in Mark 5, verses 1 to 19. Father was surprised that the spirits told Jesus, My name is Legion, for we are many. In verse 9, That's true, he said. When I went to the church for Junior's baptism, I went with a legion of evil spirits. The fifth day, Uncle Cesario didn't tell any stories. Father was afraid to ask why, and he went for a long walk. That evening, he became upset when a temple priest called him to ask for help securing animals for sacrifices. Let the spirits be the sacrifice, he blurted out. They commanded me to kill my own son. Solve your own problems without me. Father, still upset, sat down at the temple for supper. Son, Uncle Cesaria said, Did you know that the devil killed Job's own son and other children? Father had never heard of Job, and he wept as he heard the story from the Bible. At the end, Father said, I've made a decision. I'll leave Candoble and get to know the Adventist's God. Please pray. The devil will try to kill me. The next day, Father returned home and announced his decision to Mother. I'm willing to follow your God, he said. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.